Welcome to Zan Khan Live, where everything is discussed and nothing is censored. Today, joining us from the United States, a biochemist and also the vice president of research of Reasons to Believe, Dr. Fazal Rana. Welcome to our show, Dr. Fazal Rana. This is Zan Khan. It is a pleasure having you on Zan Khan Live. Thank you, Zan, for having me. Joining us from Vienna, a prominent intelligent design advocate and also a paleontologist, part of the Discovery Institute, a prominent intelligent design think tank, Dr. Gunter Beckley. Welcome to our show, Dr. Gunter Beckley. This is Zan Khan. It is a pleasure having you. Thanks for having me. It is such a pleasure having you both gentlemen discussing the topic of God, science, and Darwin. I want to ask you this question. Many authors claim that science has disproven God. H how do you perceive this notion? Yeah, I think it's nonsense. Uh, and if science has disproven God, then it has only disproven some kind of caricature of God. Let's say the, the Zeus-like picture of God is disproven by science or Thor-like. Uh, but not the god of classical theism as it is uh, proposed by, let's say, the Abrahamitic uh, monotheistic religions, uh, because uh, it's not in the ballpark of science to disprove this hypothesis. And on the contrary, if we look at the results from modern science, and that reaches from, let's say, modern physics, cosmology, quantum mechanics, uh, to biology, genetics, uh, there is an accumulation of results from modern physics that rather point uh, to theism and, and show that uh, this classical view of a clockwork universe where everything is determined by laws of nature is wrong and that there are phenomena that can only be explained if the underlying reality is mind-based and is information-based, which resonates very well with uh, theism. And uh, so I think it's not only false, it's the opposite. It's rather uh, modern science is more and more uh, pointing towards the God hypothesis than, than pointing away from. Dr. Fazal Rana, you, you're a scholar on the subject. You're a biochemist. So how do you see this notion from a biochemist point of view? Yes, I would uh, strongly agree with uh, Gunter uh, that uh, in my experience, it's not only that, it's not true that science has disproved God or has created a space where faith has no place, but rather it's the opposite, that the evidence that we see from uh, all the different disciplines of science clearly point to the fact that there must be a mind that undergirds ultimately uh, the reality of the universe. And, and I like to look at some of the classical philosophical arguments that have been used for God's existence, you know, for example, like the cosmological argument that if, you know, something begins to exist, it must have a cause that's greater than itself. And of course, we've discovered that it, it appears as if at least our local universe that we're part of has a cause that is outside of the universe. Or if we look at the universe, we see design in the fundamental constants of the universe. Or when we look at uh, biological systems and biochemical systems, we see just this incredible elegance and, and evidence for design in these systems. Uh, everything has this appearance of design, which supports the, the teleological argument for God's existence. So to me, it's really encouraging that you know, philosophical arguments for God's existence are being strongly and powerfully informed by scientific advance, pointing to the reality that there must be a God you know, that would be consistent with a, a personal God, uh, a, the God of theism. Dr. Gunter Beckley, why do some scientists claim that science has disproven God? That's a good question. And uh, I think it has not so much to do with science itself, but rather with the uh, background that those scientists have and the, the and worldview issues. And of course, we have today a situation where natural sciences have, in a way, since probably the, the 19th century already, has been hijacked by a certain worldview, which is the worldview of materialism and uh, naturalism. Uh, 
And uh, therefore, a lot of scientists think that this is congruent and that, is, uh, that uh, naturalism and materialism is equivalent with science and everything that is non-materialist and is not atheistic and not materialistic and supernaturalistic, that this must be non-science or even anti-science. And I think that is a reason why a lot of scientists uh, have this kind of delusion that science uh, points against all these kinds of views and then bring naive arguments like Richard Dawkins did in his best-selling book. I actually don't understand how this book could be a bestseller because even somebody with an, uh, a high school level of philosophy will recognize that this is re really poorly argued philosophy. Uh, but, uh, he, he thinks that he makes arguments from science against theism, but actually all these arguments are either fallacious or uh, not arguing against the God hypothesis that is proposed by, let's say, Christianity or, or Islam. So um, I think the issues those scientists have are worldview issues and not scientific issues. I've read your book, Dr. Fazel, and I've read your work. Um, you claim that evidence for creation emerges from biochemistry, genetics, human origins, and uh, synthetic biology. Uh, how do you claim that? Explain this. Yeah, well, uh, you know, and, and Gunther made this point earlier, and that is that regardless of the, the discipline of science, you see very clear indications that uh, a mind must fundamentally be involved in, in, again, the origin in the design of the universe and the origin and the design, and I would even extend it to the history of life as well. Uh, and so that, that point is merely that each discipline of science comes to the table with its own, you know, unique sets of, of, of evidence. Uh, you know, for me as a biochemist, when I look at the, the operation of, this, uh, of what's happening inside the cell at the molecular level, it's just mind boggling. And it's not just simply the, the sheer complexity of biochemical systems. It's the fact that they're so elegant and sophisticated. And what's also eerie to me is many of these biochemical systems have this interesting, these interesting structural and functional features that are highly reminiscent of the types of designs that we would produce as, as human beings, which to me, it gives new vitality to the, the classical argument for God's existence known as the watchmaker argument. Or even when you look at the work that's being done, for example, in synthetic biology, where researchers are trying to create artificial cells in a laboratory setting. Uh, th th in fact, there was just a, a paper published that's getting quite a bit of, 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 of uh, discussion uh, in, in the last day or two by Craig Venter and his colleagues, where they claim to have created an, an artificial cell that can replicate on its own. Uh, this work, again, is, is remarkable work, but what's, what undergirds all of the work in synthetic biology is the central role that intelligent agency plays in converting molecular systems into these systems that begin to assume the properties of life. So even when we look at the, the cutting edge of, of biotechnology, what we see is, uh, again, evidence that suggests a mind must be responsible for creating life to begin with or uh, to manipulate life forms in radical ways to create new artificial organisms. Dr. Gunter, you're an academic. Uh, you're part of the Discovery Institute. Um, it, it, it works when it, when, when it comes to science. Um, do you think when you look at the scientific advancement in the last 25 years, do you think that it points more towards a creator? the evidence uh, in the last 25 years in science? Yes, yes, but, but yes with a qualifier and the qualifier would be the following. Uh, and uh, this is, let's say, uh, 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 using a definition that is not from me, but from a American philosopher called William Lane Craig. And he said, science cannot prove God per se, but what science can do is that science provides evidence for the truth of premises in a philosophical argument that then has theistic implications. And I think this is exactly what the case. So the, a lot of modern scientific results 
from cosmology, Big Bang cosmology, from quantum mechanics, and even more modern stuff like, like simulation theory or emergent space time or so on. Uh, they all point to the truth of premises in arguments that then have uh, the God hypothesis as either a deductive conclusion or as the best uh, explanation and an inference to the best explanation. And so I think definitely uh, results of modern science increasingly point to, to the God hypothesis in this, in a way, indirect way. What's your opinion, Dr. Fazal Rana? Do you think in the last 25 years, science, uh, it, it, it gives evidence for a creator or towards atheism? No, I, I think that, you know, if there is a trend line, it is towards, uh, I think, uh, design in the universe and, uh, and whether that the design is in the, the fundamental constants of, of physics or in the, the, the characteristics of, you know, our earth and, and, and moon, you know, solar system or uh, as being a rare and kind of unique system that looks like it's been design for life or whether it's in the nature of biochemistry or again, biological systems, I think we see mounting evidence for design. And, you know, I, I liked Gunter's answer, answer is that, that again, that evidence for design strongly supports philosophical arguments for God's existence, uh, like the, the teleological argument that if we see design, it comes from a designer. And of course, if it's a designer, that suggests a personality too, that, that the designer has, has a personality and that there's uh, a, a purpose ultimately for the universe if, again, there is a personality that has designed it. So these are really metaphysical implications that are flowing out of the scientific evidence. But I think the, the implications are more compatible with uh, theism than they are with uh, an atheistic or materialistic worldview. Uh, Dr. Fazel, we did a show back a few years ago regarding your criticism towards intelligent design. Now, this is like the first time you've actually used the word design in your argument. Normally, you use the, use the phrase fine-tuned. Now, what are your arguments uh, on the theory of intelligent design? Um, and, and what is the difference between intelligent design and fine-tuning? Oh, I don't, I don't think I, I see any difference between intelligent design and fine tuning. You know, I think fine tuning is indication, an indication of design. And, you know, if, if there are, are criticisms I have of intelligent design, I just think that uh, the, the, the ID movement uh, has a different set of objectives than what I, the, the objectives that are, the organization that I work for has. You know, our organization is distinctly or uniquely a, a Protestant Christian organization, which is trying to use these discoveries in science as a way to essentially build a bridge to the, the, the Christian gospel. So that is our objective. And so uh, if there is a criticism of ID, it would be simply, I don't know that ID goes far enough in the sense that uh, uh, it, it seems to be satisfied with establishing design and maybe that that design comes from a, a personality. But I, you know, our a, 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 um, objective is to try to go further and to, to argue that we can even begin to, to get a sense of who that designer is. So for, and, and I've already alluded to some of those points. So for example, if the universe has a beginning, then that designer must be a transcendent you know, if we see design, there must be a personality. The fact that there's constancies for, constancy for the, to the laws of nature tells us something about the nature of the designer as well. You know, that would be, you know, I would argue compatible with, again, uh, a type of, of theism. And so that, that would be essentially, if there is a criticism, it would be maybe the ID movement doesn't go quite far enough. But I think some of that, again, reflects differences in objectives of, of, the, of the two research programs. Dr. Gunter, how do you address this? Because you're one of the leading uh, ID proponents, advocates. How do you see Dr. Yeah, Fazal Rana's argument? I, I would think that Faz and, and I, or generally he and, and the ID movement are totally on the same page concerning the de design inference so that we can infer design from empirical evidence in nature. 
And so the difference uh, ID movement to let's say a think tank like uh, Reasons to Believe would be that the ID movement uh, makes a case that this method to infer design is distinctly a method that can be part of natural sciences, not of philosophy or theology. Uh, and uh, that it is inherently restricted to this design inference. And it's not just some kind of cowardice or that uh, design theorists will not say, well, it's the God of, of Christianity or, uh, but that's the limit of the method. The method can only infer the fact of design, but not who is the designer. That does not exclude that uh, design proponents can use this inference and then ask the question, but well, what does this tell us about the designer? And then you can use philosophical arguments. And there is now a forthcoming book uh, by, by one of the leaders of the intelligent design movement by Stephen C. Meyer called Re Return of the God Hypothesis, uh, where he exactly makes uh, arguments for certain characteristics that you can infer from uh, the design inference, like Fast just said that the designer has to be transcend, has to transcend space and time, has to be all powerful and so on, and that you ultimately converge to the typical char characteristics of, of classical theism. But that is, I think, uh, transgressing the design method and then using this evidence to make philosophical arguments for theism, which I think is totally legitimate. And, and uh, it depends, of course, on the background of the people. Some ID theorists are, are not Christians and are have Jewish background or Muslim background or are deists. Or, uh, so uh, it will depend what is your otherwise worldview background uh, will influence who you think the designer is. Uh, so I, I would think this is more or less a methodological and, and maybe even partly even more or less linguistic distinction. But I think for, for most arguments, we, we both agree that there's definitely evidence for design in nature. Yeah, and I, I really much, very much appreciate Gunther's answer in 100% in, in, in agreement. It's, uh, I, I think the ID movement is, again, really uh, restricting their, their conclusions into, into the realm of science where at reasons to believe we're much more comfortable blurring those boundaries. But, but I actually also strongly agree with Gunther in the sense that, that the design inference is actually a bona fide scientific methodology that it's not philosophical, but it's truly scientific. And in fact, it's exactly the methodology used by SETI researchers and by archeologists and so it's very different. It, it seems disingenuous to me to say that archaeology and SETI are science, but that reaching a, a design inference of mind undergirds the totality of reality, that seems disingenuous. And to say that that's philosophical and not scientific, I think, is, is a, 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 an illegitimate maneuver on the part of people that oppose ID. Dr. Fuzz, a similar method is also used by our scientists when we go to Mars. Am I correct? Oh, yes, exactly. The, the design inference shows up everywhere <laughs> in science, you know. Yes. Uh, Dr. Guncher, I, I want to ask you this question. Where do you think uh, the intelligent design lacks, the theory lacks, and where do you think it needs more work to actually be solidified as science? Uh, I think the work is not so much on the theoretical part. I think the, the theory of intelligent design and the methodology is very well worked out. What it needs now is more application on concrete examples where it shows that these uh, methods leads to concrete results. So I'm currently, for example, working on a research project focusing on the so-called waiting time problem. Uh, uh, trying to find uh, evidence, and, and we actually have first results in this uh, direction that the geologically available windows of time are not sufficient uh, to accommodate these necessary genetic changes and, and therefore rule out some kind of gradual stepwise uh, 
uh, naturalistic process to account for the, the major transitions. So uh, uh, this is one thing, more really concrete research project. There are a lot going on, a lot are going on a little bit undercover because scientists still have to be a little bit careful uh, because of, of career risks if you are too outspoken as a design proponent, but there are more design friendly scientists doing re design research out there than, than many of our opponents uh, think. And, uh, but the other uh, realm where we definitely need more is simply uh, public relation and uh, bringing this message out there that this, in spite of all the propaganda from, from materialists and atheists and, and uh, naturalists uh, who try to paint uh, the design inference as just some kind of creationism in disguise or, or in a cheap tuxedo, uh, to really uh, at least uh, try to influence those open-minded, let's say younger aspiring uh, scientists to, to have a look in the actual arguments. That's what convinced me when I was still a Darwinist and, and encountered these arguments and looked into these arguments and researched uh, what are possible uh, responses to it and, and then follow the evidence wherever it leads. And I think there cannot be enough efforts to, to get this message out and try to, to educate the, the public and especially the, the scientific community about what intelligent design really is, how it works, what it can achieve, what it cannot achieve. And uh, yeah, that I think is a very important point to, to counter this massive anti propaganda by, by mainstream Darwinian and naturalistic science. Dr. Fazal Rana and Dr. Gunter, whenever I read some of your work, you are big crit critiques when it comes to Darwin. Now, I want to ask Dr. Fazal Rana, uh, can you give us a, a glimpse of what Darwin had available when he was, when he wrote the book Origin of Species, what science was available at his time? Well, you know, something that I think is fascinating is that when Darwin proposed his, his theory of evolution, uh, much of what we know today about modern day biology was unknown to Darwin. Uh, you know, he, his view of the cell as an example was the protoplasmic view of the cell where the cell was a, a, an envelope that surrounded uh, some kind of jelly-like material with a nucleus in it. And of course, in the contravening years, we've discovered just the, the sheer level of complexity of, uh, of what's going on inside the cell. It's, it's mind boggling. We're still uncovering details about how the cell is structured and how the cell works. And, and so that would you know, be just one example of, of what was completely unknown to Darwin. And while he never addressed the origin of life question in Origins of Species in a a letter to Joseph Hooker, he speculated on the idea of life originating in a warm little pond. Well, that becomes a, a relatively reasonable idea if all you think that the, the, the interior of the cell consists of is some kind of protoplasmic jelly, you know, that could be formed through some kind of simple chemical reactions. But when you understand just the sheer complexity of, of biochemical systems, that becomes a very difficult idea to, I think, sustain. And of course, Today, the origin of life problem ranks as one of the outstanding, you know, quote unquote, scientific mysteries of our time. Nobody knows how life originates in part because of the, 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 the complexity of, again, of what even the simplest life form requires. So you have to begin to wonder if Darwin would actually have proposed his theory of evolution if he knew today what he knew then when he proposed this theory. Now, I think he still would have probably suggested that speciation can happen through natural selection. I think that part of Darwin's theory is, is robust, that it explains you know, uh, microevolution and speciation. Uh, it explains what we see happening with microorganisms, but I don't think the theory actually has the capacity today to explain bona fide um, innovation in, in, the life's, in life's history. When it comes to events in life's history where we see innovation, this is where Darwin's theory breaks down. And I think he probably would have proposed what you might call a special theory, but the general theory or the grandiose claim that this mechanism can explain the totality of biology, including designs. I think Darwin, if he knew now what he knew, or if we, he knew then what we know now, I think he would have been much more circumspect 
to extend that mechanism uh, as an all encompassing explanatory mechanism. Dr. Gunter, when we see the advancement in science, uh, do you think that uh, now, uh, does Darwin's theory still represent a viable explanation of nature's record, in your opinion? No, and, and actually, uh, in spite of the claims, the grand claims by, by people like Richard Dawkins, who says there is no debate and it's proven and it's fact and so on, actually, uh, there is only a minority of biologists who really think about these questions. Uh, that is this minority of theoretical biologists who explore the theoretical underpinnings of the theory of evolution. And among these people, there is a growing consensus uh, that Darwinism has failed to explain the crucial phenomena of the origin of phenotypic complexity, of novel structures, of, of discontinuities in the history of life, and so on. Uh, therefore, we have this whole thing called extended synthesis and different attempts to find something else than the, the neo-Darwinian paradigm of just chance and necessity. And uh, actually all these proposals that have been made as, as alternatives like niche construction and, and Evo Devo and, and phenotypic plasticity, they all have either failed to address the crucial problems or, or uh, ultimately have to fall back on some kind of neo-Darwinism to explain how they came about. And so uh, if some people say, well, there's a consensus, 99% of all biologists believe that Darwinism is true and that evolution is a fact, that's irrelevant because 99% of, uh, of biologists have never thought about these questions deeply and are unaware of the problems of the theory. But uh, if you look at those people that really think about this, even if they are totally materialists and naturalists, they are aware that this Darwinian approach has failed. And I think this tells us something because it's not for nothing that uh, Dawkins said uh, only Darwin uh, made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist or, or uh, Daniel Dennett said uh, Darwinism was li like a kind of universal acid. And if th this idea by Darwin, which in a way was a brilliant idea that you could explain complex information by a bottom-up process of random variation and then this filter of, of natural or sexual selection. If this has failed, then the only idea that humanity ever came up with in 2000 years of, of Western thought and of philosophy of science, if this has failed, then I think naturalists stand empty-handed to explain uh, complexity in biology, for example. And this is not even speaking about things like the incredible fine tuning of the physical constants of the universe or, or the origin of all space time with the Big Bang and all this kind of stuff. So um, I think Darwinism definitely has failed. It's not false like most theories. Ultimately, it's just shown that it has a restricted applicability. Of course, Darwinism is correct, let's say on the level of minor variations within a species where uh, of course selection uh, mostly has the effect of stabilizing the phenotype of a, of a species and under some condition this may change and may generate new species, but only because you can make 10 species of finches from one species of finch doesn't tell you how you got finches in the first place or bird feathers or something like that. So I think Darwinism for what it wanted to explain, what it should explain, the real origin of, of biological complexity, the theory definitely has failed. Dr. Fuzz, um, I want to ask a hypothetical question. If you think Darwin was alive today, would he still be committed to his original theory? How, how do you say? It? You know, those are fun questions to, to, to play around with, of course. And I actually think he would. Uh, and, and the reason why I would take that position is that when you read um, the, the motivation that, that undergirded Darwin when he was proposing, again, this grand explanation for, you know, life's, for, for biology, he was really undergirded, I think, by uh, his... The, by the problem of evil. The, you know, he, he, he looked around and he saw a world that he interpreted as nature red and tooth and claw, where there are these clumsy designs where he saw, again, natural evil in the world. And he had a difficult time attributing that 
to the handiwork of, uh, of, of, the, of, of the God of the Bible. And on top of that, he um, suffered personal loss, particularly the, the death of, of children, two of his children, I believe, uh, that really made him, I think, question, uh, again, God's goodness. And, and so it was, that was, was, you know, the ultimate motivation, I think, behind Darwin proposing what I would call his general theory, or this, again, this grand claim that evolutionary mechanisms can explain everything. And, you know, it's interesting because uh, right before he died, he wrote an, his autobiography, and that was published in a, in a sanitized version initially by, you know, by Darwin's either children or, or grandchildren, and later it was republished in an unabridged version. And in the unabridged version, it's very clear that Darwin was a committed atheist. In his public writings, he was very careful to disguise his atheistic perspective, but it's very clear that he was an atheist. And as Gunther is pointing out, you know, if you're going to uh, embrace atheism, there needs to be something that gives legitimacy to accounting for the design you see in biology. And if you can explain it through some kind of mechanism, then it makes atheism intellectually fulfill, satisfying, as, as Dawkins said. Um, and, and so I think Darwin's ultimate motivation was more uh, driven by worldview considerations than actually by what the, the evidence truly allowed him to, to, adv uh, to advance. Dr. Gunter, if you were to criticize uh, Darwin right now, what, what do you think is the most prominent critique of Darwin, of yours? Of course, it's difficult if you have the knowledge that we have now to criticize him for the knowledge that he had then. I actually would disagree a little bit with Fass on this point if Darwin would have uh, considered changing his mind uh, because I, I totally agree he was motivated by the problem of evil and by the tragic loss, especially of his beloved daughter, Annie. Uh, but he also was much more prudent than many of his modern proponents and, uh, of Darwinism and, and was very careful in his argumentation and very much aware of possible problems. And he was aware, for example, of this problem of the fossil record, but he hoped that this could, would change over time. But now we have 150 years of paleontological research and very good statistical tests for the completeness of the fossil record. So he would see, well, this problem didn't disappear. It got bigger over time, which tells us something. If gaps get bigger over time with more knowledge, this usually points to gaps that are real out there in nature and are not just gaps uh, based on insufficient knowledge or undersampling or something. And uh, other thing, for example, many critics of intelligent design say, well, this nonsense of ir irreducible complexity that certain idea creationists came up with. Actually, this idea is based on, on something that Charles Darwin said, uh, where he said, if you could find a structure that could not be built up by a stepwise process, then his theory would totally break down. So as Fass said, he thought the cell is just a blob of jelly. If he would see the delicate uh, molecular machines that we have discovered on the level of, of the cell and the cellular mechanisms or the physiology on, let's say, on the level of photosynthesis, or um, I'm not sure if he would still be willing to, to make these grandiose claims concerning, the, or concerning macro evolution, or if he would rather restrict his theory to a theory of micro evolution on the species level. But of course, that's an exercise in kind of counterfactual history. So we don't know what, what would have happened if he had this knowledge. Uh, he didn't. So my critic of Darwin, if I would criticize him for what he did know, the only thing would be uh, something that his contemporary critics also had, that he was... Uh, extrapolating too much from, from the evidence he had. The evidence he had was definitely evidence for microevolutions. So for minor variations and that uh, there are relationships between, let's say the same, uh, within the same genus, uh, uh, different species are based on common ancestry. I think the evidence for this is, is very good. Uh, but 
extrapolating this together with uh, the factor of if you take a lot of time and then multiplying a lot of microevolution, then you have the explanation how you got from a, a prokaryote cell to, to a human being or all the other complexity in life. Uh, I think that was really overstretching the, the evidence and, and was an attempt to desperately, as, as Fass said, find a naturalistic explanation as an alternative to the design explanation. Dr. Fuzz, last question. Uh, you in your book and also Stephen St. Myers in his book, uh, you've both mentioned something similar to what Dr. Gunter just said, molecular machines. So when you look into the microscope, are there actually like molecular machines or is that just a metaphor? Uh, well, you know, people that are critics of ID uh, would argue that it is just a metaphor to refer to biochemical systems as, as machines. But uh, the fact of the matter is that they really are machines in, in every sense of the word. So for example, just a couple of quick instances where it's clear that these molecular systems that appear like machines are truly machines. One of these is uh, my favorite protein complex, ATP synthase, which is found in the inner membrane of mitochondria, at least in eukaryotic organisms. And this is literally an electrically powered rotary motor. And in fact, uh, a team of researchers working in nanosystems actually co-opted this machine from the cell and interfaced it to a, a nano device that they were building as a way to power movement in motion in this nano device. So in other words, not only did they conceive of this as a machine, but they literally employed it as a machine in their, in their designs. Or another place where you see this really eerie similarity between human designs and, and biochemical systems has to do with the machinery that manipulates DNA during processes like uh, DNA replication, as an example. DNA, of course, is an information harboring molecule, and that information is in a digital format. It's discrete units that make up the information. Well, it turns out that the proteins that manipulate DNA during, again, a process like DNA replication are literally operating as Turing machines. It's literally, DNA replication is literally a computer operation. And in fact, this insight has inspired an area of nanotechnology called DNA computing, where people are building wet computers out of DNA in the molecules that manipulate DNA in the cell. And these are more powerful than the, the, than the most powerful silicon-based computers that we've built, simply because uh, we can take advantage of massive parallel operations. But the point here is that it's very hard to argue that this is just a metaphor uh, when in fact, technologists are co-opting these designs from the cell and incorporating them into designs in nanotechnology. Thank you so much, Dr. Fazel Rana, for being on ZanCon Live. It's always a pleasure having you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gunter Beckley. It's always a pleasure having you. It was my pleasure. Thank you. You are watching Dr. Fazel Rana joining us from the United States, a biochemist, and also Dr. Gunter Beckley, a paleontologist, joining us from Vienna. We were discussing God, science, and Darwin. Until the next episode of Zan Khan Live, keep on watching Zan Khan Live. Take care. Goodbye.